Hey, I'm about to film a video for finding Ohana. What are the chances you think I get through this video without crying? Oh, very, very slim. Probably zero. Negative percentage, if that's possible. Alright, I'll let you know how it goes. First YouTube video in almost a year. Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel. My name is Anna and today we're gonna to be talking about the new Netflix film, Finding Ohana. So if you haven't watched the movie yet, there will be spoilers. When I first saw the trailer for Finding Ohana, the first thought I had was that they were trying to make a Hawaiian version of Goonies. Final notice. You're about to lose your house. This is our Ohana's land. I'm gonna die before I leave. It's real goatee. This is how we can get the money and help Papa. That's actually what I text family and friends and what I told them on the phone. The movie clearly does take a lot of inspiration from Goonies and the, another very popular treasure hunter series, Indiana Jones. They even cast Ku Hoi Kwan who plays Data in Goonies and Short Round in Indiana Jones. And there are references to slick shoes and the Finches of Peril if you take a good look. The screenwriter Christina Strain said she envisioned a version where all the kids were Data, not just one. So if you didn't already know, I am half Chamorro, not Hawaiian. There are a lot of cultural similarities between Chamorros and Hawaiian. We even have some borrowed words. So I am speaking from an Islander's perspective on this movie, not specifically a Hawaiian perspective. I did live in Hawaii for three and a half years and I attended the University of Hawaii at Manoa for two and a half years. It's also the school Brad Kalilimoku, the actor who plays Kua attended. He was a senior while I was a freshman, but I don't remember ever seeing him on campus. Me. Damn it. So I want to talk about what this movie really got right for me. Casting is the first thing that this movie got right. The majority of the actors in this movie are either of Hawaiian heritage or of Pacific Islander heritage. You guys look taller in the picture. Go ahead. Which is appreciated after other movies cast people who weren't. So to make sure that this movie was culturally accurate, they actually hired a number of consultants to be on this movie. That includes cultural consultants, language consultants, and even tattoo consultants. So that brings us to language and the use of Hawaiian pidgin. I don't know about you, but I automatically have subtitles on when I'm watching a movie. I'm not really sure why it started, but I do. And I noticed while I was watching the movie that they translate the Hawaiian pidgin in the subtitles. I didn't know how to feel about this at first, but Gilbert actually told me that he would have needed me to translate the Hawaiian Pigeon if they didn't translate it for him. I recommend, if you're unfamiliar with Hawaiian Pigeon, to go... If you're unfamiliar with Hawaiian Pigeon, I do recommend that you have on the subtitles just so that you can get a better feel for what's actually being said. And you'll hear Kelly Hu switch from mainland or American English to Hawaiian Pigeon in the movie. Another place where this movie succeeds is by using certain characters as exposition without making it feel like it's an information dump. Hana and Casper both live in Hawaii, Hana being Kanaka and Casper being white, but having been raised in Hawaii. Between Hana and Casper sharing information with Iwane and Pili, we learn that as the audience as well. Particularly with Casper, I appreciate that this was a character who is not an islander but has a clear appreciation for Hawaii for the people, for the land, and for the culture. When Casper and Pili are at Kualoa Ranch, Ryan, one of the employees that works there, tells Casper, I thought you guys were some trespassing Haole tourists, which to me means that he doesn't think of Casper as Haole. People who are unfamiliar with the word Haole will think that that's something that's derogatory. It's not. The literal translation is without breath. That's because the traditional Hawaiian greeting is to honi, which is to breathe in. When Captain Cook and his men discovered Hawaii for the first time, they didn't do that. So they were they greeted Hawaiians without breath. Another point that they make several times is that Iwane, Pili, their mother, and their papa are all Kanaka. They're all native Hawaiian. While their grandfather is in the hospital, he has something bunched up on his lap that is red, yellow, and green. They're actually the colors of the Kanaka Mali flag, which is the native Hawaiian flag. If you don't know what that flag 
is and what it looks like, you may not know that that is what is on Papa's lap, that that's what he's holding. But it's those little touches that the people who know that that's there are going to appreciate. I'll probably keep finding cultural Easter eggs the more I watch it. Where Finding Ohana stands out against Goonies and Indian Jones for me is in weaving in the spiritual aspects of Hawaiian culture in making mana and the lapu an integral part of how this story comes to an end is where the waterworks really started. So as I mentioned before, I'm not Hawaiian, I am tomorrow, and we do have some cultural similarities. The lapu in Hawaii are the spirits of fallen Hawaiian warriors. Hey! Why do you have a drawing of a night marcher? You know what that is? Ghosts of Hawaiian warriors. You said they march at night. You know they're coming when you hear their drums. Well, sleep tight. In Guam, we have what's called the Tatamona, which are the spirits of our ancestors, including warriors. In Hawaii, when you're referencing somebody's power, you're referencing their mana. As they mentioned in the movie, caves are traditionally Hawaiian burial grounds and therefore they are kapu. And the reason for that is they wanted to be able to protect the mana of the dead. In Guam, they would do something different. They would take the bones of those who have passed and actually keep them in their home to protect the people who were living there. Because the caves are kapu, Hana leaves an offering at the entrance of the cave, explaining that she means no disrespect by entering and that she does it with a clean heart. I have to enter. I mean, no disrespect. Your turn. In Guam, before going fishing, going into the jungle, before cutting down a tree, anything like that, you're supposed to ask the Tatamona for permission. Now, nobody really expects for you to hear an answer, but it's a sign of respect for the people who came before you. Souls that are still tied to the Aina, tied to the Tano, and tomorrow tied to the land. What's up, Mountain? You looking beautiful right now. You're good. We can go now. There were a few moments sprinkled throughout the movie where I kind of started tearing up, but the end with the arrival of the Lapu is where I really got in my feels. So, Kua, Ioana and Pili's dad, is among the Lapu and he protects them. I knew as soon as I heard his voice say no, and then I saw his boots. For those of you who don't know, both of my parents served in the army. My dad served for 30 years. A lot of my family members served, aunt, uncles, cousins. So that moment for me was kind of personal. And so here I was, I sat in front of my computer watching this movie while FaceTiming with Gilbert, just tears just coming down my face, just like, you know, the rolling kind, like, like, oh, oh my God. When we first see Kua, those that are with him are all pre-colonial. They cut away from Kua and the Lapu to more Lapu on the beach. And this is just where I lost it because they included modern day warriors and there were just generations and generations of Hawaiian warriors, be they soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, and for me, it really meant a lot to not just see, imagine my younger self appreciating this movie so much because it's about Islanders and it includes so much about island culture, Hawaiian culture specifically, but it acknowledged to me the sacrifices that Pacific Islanders have made for generations and continue to make. Even if we look at the timeline of this movie, it's 2021, they talk about them having been gone for 11 years after Kua died, which would have been around 2010, the Afghan or Iraq war. And when you're looking at all of the Lapu on the beach, there are pre-colonial and then there are some that to me were distinctly World War II, Vietnam, Gulf War, and I know the struggle some islanders have gone through to even feel recognized in any way. As a Pacific Islander, as the daughter of former service members, as a writer, as somebody who used to live in Hawaii, who misses it every day, this hit me on so many levels. And I was so grateful to see the islander characters in this movie were not caricatures. They were not stereotypes to be, be made fun of. 
they were not sidekicks they were not background characters they were the focus of this movie to see that kind of representation and to see the reception that this movie was getting it just makes me so happy i'm so glad that my little cousins my nieces my nephews and eventually my own children will be able to look at movies like this and be able to see somebody who comes from a similar culture to them somebody who kind of looks like them i didn't have a whole lot of that growing up even something like Moana, I went and I saw that with a friend of mine who came in traditional Samoan attire and I was like, dude, you could have at least told me to go get my lay out of my car. If you're Islander, if you're not, I highly recommend this movie. It's so cute. It's so well done. I'm probably going to watch it again a couple times this weekend. And I'm going to keep telling everybody I know to watch it, which is why I made this video. All right, everybody, that's it for me today. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.